Welcome to the Intel AI Lounge. Today we're very excited to share with you the Precision Medicine panel discussion. I'll be moderating the session. My name is Kay Aaron. I'm the General Manager of Health and Life Sciences at Intel. And I'm excited to uh, share with you the three panelists that we have here. First is John Madison. He is the Chief Information Medical Officer and he is part of the um, Kaiser, Institute, Kaiser Permanente. We're very excited to have you here. Thank you, John. Thank you. We also have Naveen Rao. He is the VP and General Manager for the Artificial Intelligence Solutions at Intel. He's also uh, the former CEO of Nirvana, which was acquired by Intel. And we also have Bob Rogers, who's the Chief Data Scientist at our AI Solutions Group. So why don't we get started with our questions. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk, introduce themselves, but as well as talk about how they got started with AI. So why don't we start with John? Sure. So can you hear me okay in the back? Can you hear? Okay, cool. So um, I am a recovering evolutionary biologist and a recovering physician and a recovering geek, um, and I implemented the, the health record system for the first and largest region, uh, Kaiser Permanente. And it's pretty obvious that uh, most of the useful data in a health record it lies in free text. So I started up a, an NL, natural language processing team to be able to mine free text about a dozen years ago. And so we can do things with that that you can't otherwise get out of health information. I'll give you an example. I read an article online from the New England Journal of Medicine about four years ago that said over half of all people who have had their spleen taken out were not appropriately vaccinated for uh, a common form of pneumonia. And when your spleen's missing, you must have that vaccine or you die a very sudden death uh, with sepsis. In fact, our medical director in Northern California's father died of exact, that exact same scenario. So when I read the article, I went to uh, two of uh, to my uh, structured data analytics team and to my natural language processing team and said, please show me everybody who has had their spleen taken out and hasn't been appropriately vaccinated. And uh, we ran through about 20 million records in about three hours with the NLP team. And it took about three weeks with a structured data analytics team. That sounds counterintuitive, but it actually happened that way. And it's not a competition for time only. It's a competition for quality and sensitivity and specificity. So we were able to identify all of our members who, sh who had their spleen taken out, who should have had a pneumococcal vaccine. We vaccinated them. And there are a number of people alive today who otherwise would have died uh, absent that uh, capability. So people don't really commonly associate natural language processing with machine learning, but in fact, uh, natural language processing relies heavily and is the first really highly successful example of machine learning. And so we've done uh, dozens of similar projects mining free text data in millions of records very efficiently, very effectively, that have really helped advance the quality of care and reduce the cost of care. Um, it's a natural step forward to go into the world of personalized medicine um, with the arrival of a $100 genome, which is actually what it costs today to do a full genome sequence. Microbiomics, that is the ecosystem of bacteria that are in our gut and, and every organ of the body, actually. Um, and we know now that there's a profound influence of what's in our gut and how we metabolize drugs, what diseases we get. Uh, you can tell in a five-year-old whether or not they were born by a vaginal delivery or a C-section delivery by, by virtue of the bacteria in the gut five years later. So if you look at the complexity of the data that exists in the genome, in the microbiome, in the health record with free text, and you look at all the other sources of data like the streaming data from my uh, a wearable monitor that I'm part of a research study on precision medicine out of Stanford, um, there is a vast amount of disparate data, not to mention all the imaging, that really um, can collectively produce much more useful information to advance our understanding of science and to advance our understanding of every individual. And then we can do the mashup of a much broader uh, range of science in healthcare with a much deeper sense of data from an individual. And to do that with structured uh, questions and, and structured data is, is, is very yesterday. Um, the only way we're going to be able to uh, uh, disambiguate those data and be able to, to operate on those data in concert and generate real useful answers from the broad array of data types and the massive quantity of data is to let loose uh, machine learning on uh, all of those data substrates. So we're 
uh, my team is moving down that pathway, and we're very excited about the future prospects for doing that. Wow. Yeah, great. That's, I think that's actually some of the, 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 the things I'm very excited about in the future with some of the technologies we're developing. Um, my background, I, I, uh, I started actually being fascinated with uh, computation in, 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 in biological forms when I was, you know, nine. I mean, reading lots of sci-fi, I was kind of a, a big dork, which I pretty much still am. I've really changed a whole lot. Uh, and uh, just basically, you know, seeing um, that machines really aren't all that different from biological uh, entities, right? We are biological machines, and and kind of understanding how a computer works and how we can how we how we engineer those things, and then trying to pull together concepts that we learn from biology into that has always been a fascination of mine. Um, you know, as an undergrad, I was in the EE kind of CS world, and even then I, I did some research projects around that. I worked in industry for about 10 years designing chips, uh, microprocessors, various kinds of ASICs, and then actually went back to school, quit my job, and got a PhD in neuroscience, and computational neuroscience, to specifically understand what, what, what's the state of the art? Uh, what do we really understand about the brain? And are there concepts there we can take and bring back? Um, inspiration has always been, you know, like we want to, we want to, we watch birds fly around. We want to figure out how to make something that flies, extract those principles, and then build a plane. Don't necessarily want to build a bird. And so, uh, Nirvana is really, you know, uh, was was the uh, culmination of all those experiences, bringing it together, um, trying to push computation in a new direction. And uh, now, as part of Intel, um, we can really add a lot of fuel to that fire. Um, I'm super excited to be part of Intel in that um, the technologies that we were developing can really proliferate and be applied to healthcare, can be applied to internet, can be applied to every facet of our lives. And some of the examples that John mentioned are extremely exciting right now. I mean, these are things we can do today. And the generality of these solutions is really going to hit every part of healthcare. I mean, um, from a personal uh, uh, viewpoint, my whole family are MDs. Um, I'm sort of the black sheep of the family. I don't have, a, don't have an MD. And uh, I've always, it's always been kind of funny to me that... Um, knowledge is concentrated in a few individuals. Like, if you have a rare, you know, tumor or something like that, you need the guy who knows how to read this MRI. Why? Why is it like that? Can't we encapsulate that knowledge in, into a computer or into an algorithm and democratize it? And the reason we couldn't do it is we just didn't know how. But now we really are getting to a point where we know how to do that. And so I want that capability to go to everybody. It'll bring the cost of healthcare down. It'll make all of us healthier. That affects everything about our society. So that's really what is exciting about it to me. That's great. So, as you heard, I'm Bob Rogers. I'm Chief Data Scientist for Analytics and Artificial Intelligence Solutions at Intel. My mission is to put powerful analytics in the hands of every decision maker. And when I think about precision medicine, decision makers are not just doctors and surgeons and nurses, but they're also case managers and care coordinators and probably most of all, patients. So we want to, the, the mission is really to put powerful analytics and AI capabilities, capabilities in the hands of, of everyone in healthcare. It's a very complex world and, and we need tools to help us navigate it. So my background, um, I started with a PhD in physics and I was modeling, computer modeling stuff falling into supermassive black holes. <laughs> and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of applications for that in the real world. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> there will be, I'm so sure. Then, yeah, one of these days. As soon as we have time travel. Um, okay, so, so uh, I actually, around 1991, I was working on my postdoctoral research, and um, I heard about neural networks, these things that could compute the way the brain computes. And so... I, I started doing some research on that. I, I wrote some papers. And um, actually, it was an interesting story. The, the, the problem that, I, that we solved that, was, that got me really excited about neural networks, which have become deep learning, uh, my office mate would come in. He was this young guy who was about to go off to grad school. He'd come in every morning, I hate my project. And I'm like, okay, finally, after two weeks, what's your project? What's the problem? And he, it turned out he had to circle these little fuzzy spots on these images from a telescope. So they were looking for the interesting things in a sky survey. And he had to circle them and write down their coordinates all summer. Anyone want to volunteer to do that? <laughs> no? Yeah, he was very unhappy. So we took the first two weeks of data that he created doing his work by hand, 
and we trained an artificial neural network to do his summer project and finished it in about eight hours of computing. And so he was like, yeah, this is amazing, I'm so happy. And we wrote a paper, I was the first author, of course, because I was the senior guy at age 24. And uh, he, was first, he was second author, his first paper ever. He was very, very excited. So you have to fast forward about 20 years. His name popped up on the internet. And, I, and so I caught my attention. He had just won the Nobel Prize in physics. <laughs> so that's what artificial intelligence will get you. So thanks, thanks Naveen. Uh, the, uh, you know, fast forwarding, I, I, I also developed some time series forecasting capabilities that allowed me to create a hedge fund that I ran for 12 years. After that, I got into healthcare, which really is the center of my passion. Um, applying healthcare to figure out how to get all the data from all those siloed sources, put it into the cloud in a secure way, and analyze it so you could actually understand those cases that John was just talking about. How do you know that that person had had a splenectomy and that they needed to get that pneumovax? Mm -hmm. You, you need to be able to search all the data. So we used AI, natural language processing, machine learning to do that. And then two years ago, I was lucky enough to join Intel. And um, you know, in the intervening time, people like Naveen actually thawed the AI winner. And we're really in a, a spring of amazing opportunities with, with AI, not just in healthcare, but, but everywhere. But of course, the, the healthcare applications are incredibly life-saving and, and empowering. So excited to be here on this, uh, on this stage with you guys. I just want to key off your comment uh, about the role of physics and AI and, and healthcare. So the field of microbiomics that I referred to earlier, back here in our gut, there's, there's more bacteria in our gut than there are cells in our body. There's 100 times more DNA in that bacteria than there is in the human genome. And we're now discovering a couple hundred species of bacteria a year that have never been you know, identified under a microscope just by their DNA. So it turns out the person who really catapulted the study and the science of microbiomics forward was an astrophysicist who did his uh, PhD in Stephen Hawking's lab on the collision of black holes and then subsequently uh, put together a team that invented virtual reality and he developed the first supercomputing center. And so how did he get an interest in microbiomics? He has the capacity to do high performance computing and the kind of advanced analytics that are required to look at 100 times the volume of the 3.2 billion base pairs in the human genome that are represented in the bacteria in our gut. Mm -hmm. And that has unleashed the whole science of microbiomics, which is going to really turn a lot of our assumptions of health and healthcare upside down. Yeah. That's Absolutely. great. I mean, that's really transformation, also a lot of data. Which right. Is, <laughs> so I just wanted to let the audience know that we want to make this an interactive session, so I'll be asking for questions in a little bit, but I will start off with one question so that you can think about it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, it looks like you've been thinking a lot about um, AI for over the years, and wanted to understand, even though AI is just really starting in healthcare, what are some of the new trends or the changes that you've seen in the last few years that will impact the, how the AI is being used going forward? So I'll start off. There, there was a paper published by um, a guy by the name of, of uh, Tegmark at Harvard last summer um, that for the first time explained why neural networks are uh, efficient beyond any mathematical model would predict. And what he, uh, and the, the title of the paper is fun, it's called uh, Deep Learning Versus Cheap Learning. And so there were two sort of punchlines of the paper. One is, is that the reason that mathematics doesn't explain the efficiency of, of neural networks is because there's a higher order of mathematics called physics. And the physics of the underlying data structures determined um, how efficient you could mine those data using machine learning tools, much more so than any mathematical modeling. And so the second thing that uh, was revealed from that paper is that the, the, the substrate of the data that you're operating on and the natural physics of those data um, have inherent levels of complexity that determine whether or not a 12-layer neural net will get you where you want to go really fast. Because when you do the, the modeling, you do, uh, uh, for those math geeks in the audience, uh, a factorial. So if there's 12 layers, there's 12 factorial permutations of different ways you could sequence the learning through those data. When you have 140 layers um, of, of a neural net, um, it's a much, much, much bigger number of permutations that, that and so it, it, you end up being hardware bound. 
And so what Max Tegmark basically said is you can determine whether to do deep learning or cheap learning based upon the underlying physics of the data substrates you're operating on um, and, and have a, a, a good insight into uh, how, to, how to optimize your hardware and your software approach to that problem. So another way to put that is that neural networks represent the world in the way the world is sort of built. Exactly. Right? It's kind of hierarchical. And this exactly. is actually, it's, it's funny because it's sort of in retrospect, like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. But <clears throat> when you're thinking about it mathematically, we're like, well, anything, any one layer, two, two layer neural network could represent any mathematical function, therefore it's fully general. And that's the way we used to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're saying, like, well, actually decomposing the world into different types of uh, 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 features that are layered upon each other is actually a much more efficient, compact representation of the world, right? Exactly. And I think this is actually precisely the point of kind of what you're getting at, okay? What, what's really exciting now is that what we were doing before was sort of building these bespoke solutions for different kinds of data, yes. right? NLP, natural language processing, there's a whole field, 25 plus years of people devoted to figuring out features, figuring out what structures um, make sense in this particular context. Those didn't carry over at all to computer vision, didn't carry over at all to time series analysis. Now, with neural networks, we've seen it at Nirvana and, and now part of Intel solving customers' problems. We apply a very similar set of techniques across all these different types of data domains and, and solve them, right? All data in the real world seems to be hierarchical. You can decompose it into this hierarchy and it works really well. Our brains are actually general structures, right? I mean, uh, as a neuroscientist, you can look at different parts of your brain, and there are differences, you know, something that takes in visual information versus auditory information, slightly different, but they're much more similar than they are different. So there is something invariant, something very common between all of these different modalities, and we're starting to learn that. And this is what is extremely exciting to me, kind of like trying to understand the biological machine that is a computer, right? We're, we're figuring it out, right? We're getting those principles. And one, one of the really fun things that Ray Kurzweil likes to talk about is, and it falls in the, the genre of biomimicry and how we um, actually replicate um, biologic evolution in our technical solutions. So if you look at, and we're beginning to understand more and more how real neural nets work in our cerebral cortex, and there's sort of a pyramid structure so that the first pass of a broad base of, of analytics it gets um, constrained to the next pass, gets constrained to the next pass, which is, which is how information is processed in the brain. So we're discovering increasingly that what we've been evolving towards in terms of architectures of neural nets is approximating the architecture of the human cortex. And the more we understand the human cortex, the more insight we get to how to optimize neural nets. So when you think about it, with millions of years of evolution of how the cortex is structured, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that the optimization protocols, if you will, in our genetic code uh, are, are profoundly uh, efficient in, in how they operate. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, um, a real um, role for looking at, at biologic evolutionary solutions vis-a-vis -vis technical solutions. Um, and there's uh, a friend of mine worked with George Church at Harvard and actually published a book um, on biomimicry, and they wrote the book completely by, in DNA. So if, you have, if all of you have your home DNA decoder, you can actually read the book on your DNA reader. Just kidding. Well, there, there's actually a startup I just saw in the... In the read, write DNA. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're actually... It's, Absolutely. Uh, Helix something... Um, yeah. What was it? Yeah, Helix. Yeah, they're, Helix. they're basically encoding information in DNA as a storage medium. And that same friend of mine that... <laughs> the, 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 the That's a company, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that same friend of mine that co-authored that biomimicry book in DNA also did the uh, estimate of the density of uh, information storage. So a cubic centimeter of DNA uh, can store an exabyte of data. I mean, that's yeah. mind-blowing. Highly dense, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Well, so you hit upon a really important point there that one of the things that's changed is, well, there are two major things that have changed in my perception from, let's say, five to ten years ago when we were we were using machine learning. You could use data to train models and make predictions to understand complex phenomena. <clears throat> but they, they had limited utility, and the challenge was that if I'm trying to build one of these things, I had to do a lot of work up front. It's called feature engineering. I had to do a lot of work to figure out what are the key attributes of that data? What are the 10 or 20 or 100 pieces of information that I should pull out of the data to feed to the model and then the model can turn it into a, a predictive machine. And so um, what's, what's really exciting about the new generation of machine learning technology, and particularly deep learning, is that it can actually learn from example data those features.
features without you having to do any pre-programming. That's why uh, Naveen is saying you can take the same sort of overall approach and apply it to a bunch of different problems because you're not having to fine tune those features. So at the end of the day, the two things that have changed to really enable this revolution is access to more data. And I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, where, where you're seeing data come from, what are the strategies around that? And then, uh, so access to data, and I'm talking millions of examples. So 10,000 of examples, most times isn't gonna cut it, but millions of examples will do it. And then the other piece is the computing capability to actually take millions of examples and optimize this algorithm in, you know, in a single lifetime. I mean, back in 91 when I started, we literally would have thousands of examples and it would take overnight to run the thing. Yeah. So now in the world of millions and they're all, you know, you're putting together all these combinations, the computing has changed a lot. I know you've made some ed revolutionary advances in that. Um, but I'm curious about the data. Where, where are sure. you seeing interesting yeah. sources of data for, for analytics? So I do some work in the genomic space, and it, there are more viable permutations of the human genome than there are people who have ever walked the face of the earth. And the polygenic determination of a phenotypic expression, translation, um, what our genome does to us in our physical uh, experience in health and disease is determined by many, many genes and the interaction of many, many genes and how they're up and down regulated. And the complexity of disambiguating which 27 genes are affecting your diabetes and um, how are they up and down regulated by different interventions is going to be different than his. It's going to be different than his. And we already know that there's four or five distinct subtype, genetic subtypes of type 2 diabetes. So physicians still think there's one disease called type 2 diabetes. There's actually at least four or five genetic variants that have been identified. And so when you start thinking about disambiguating, particularly when we don't know what 95% of DNA does still, um, what actually is the underlying cause, it will require this massive capability of developing these feature vectors, sometimes intuiting it, if you will, from the data itself, um, and other times uh, taking what's no knowledge to develop some of those feature vectors and be able to really understand the interaction of the genome and the microbiome and the, the phenotypic data. So there's um, the, the complexity is high, and because the variation complexity is high, you do need these massive numbers. Now I'm going to make a very personal pitch here, um, so forgive me, but if any of you have any role in policy at all, let me tell you what's happening right now. So the Genomic Information Non-Discrimination Act, so-called GINA, passed by a friend of mine, written by a friend of mine past, uh, a number of years ago, says that no one can be discriminated against for health insurance based upon their genomic information. That's cool. That should allow all of you to freely feel comfortable donating your DNA to science, right? Wrong. You are 100% unprotected from discrimination for life insurance, long-term care, and disability, and it's being practiced legally today, and there's legislation in the House in markup right now to completely undermine that le the existing GINA legislation and say that whenever there's another applicable statute like HIPAA that the GINA is irrelevant, that none of the fines and penalties are applicable at all. So we need a ton of data to be able to operate on. We will not be getting a ton of data to operate on until we have the kind of protection we need to, to tell people, you can trust us, you can give us your data, you will not be subject to discrimination. And that is not the case today, and it's being further undermined. So I want to make a plea to any of you that have any policy influence um, to go after that because we need this data to help the understanding of he human health and disease, and we're not going to get it when people look behind the curtain and see that discrimination is occurring today based upon genetic information. Well, I don't like the idea of being discriminated against based on my DNA. Right. Um, especially given how little we actually know. There are only, exactly. There's so much complexity in how these things unfold in our own bodies that I think anything that is being done is probably childishly immature and, and oversimplifying. So That's right. it's pretty rough. Well, I guess the translation here is that we're all unique. It's not just a Disney movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> we really are. And I think uh, um, one, of the, one of the strengths that I'm seeing, kind of going back to the original point of, of these new techniques, is they're, it's going across different data types will actually allow us to, to learn more about the uniqueness of an individual, right? It's not going to be just from one data source, right? We're collecting data from very, many different modalities, right? We're collecting, like, um, uh, behavioral data from 
from wearables. We're, we're collecting things from scans, from blood tests, um, from, from the genome, from many different sources, and the ability to integrate those into a, a unified picture, right? That's the important thing that we're getting toward now. And I think that's what I think is gonna be super exciting here. Like, think about it, right? Every one of us, I can, I can tell you, visualize a, a coin, right? You can visualize a coin. Not only when you, you visualize it, you also know what it feels like. You know how heavy it is. You, you have a mental model of that from many different perspectives. And if I take away one of those senses, you can still identify the coin. If I tell you to put your hand in your pocket and, and pick out a coin, you, you probably can do that with 100% reliability. And that's because we have this generalized capability to, to build a model of, a, of, a, of something in the world. And that's what we need to do for individuals is actually take all these different data sources and come up with a model for an individual and you can actually then say what drug works best on this, what treatment works best on this. It's gonna get better with time, it's not gonna be perfect. Because this is what a doctor does, right? Like a doctor who's very experienced, you're a practicing physician, right? Back me up here. It, that's what you're doing. It's like you basically have some categories. You're taking information from the patient when you talk with them, and you're building a mental model. And you like apply what you know uh, uh, could work on that patient, right? I don't have clinic hours anymore, but I do take care of many friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> well, you used to. You used to. I practiced for many years before yes. I became a full-time geek. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I thought you were a recovering geek. I am. Uh, <laughs> I do more policy now. <laughs> He's off the wagon. I just want to take a moment and see if there's anyone from an audience who would like to ask. Oh. Go ahead. We got a oh. mic here. Hang on one second. So I have tons of tons of questions. Uh, Bouncer. So, Sorry. <laughs> yes. So first of all, the microbiome and the genome are really complex. You already hit about that. Yet most of the studies we do are small scale, and and we have difficulty repeating them. You know, from study to study. How are we going to reconcile all that? And what are sort of the technical hurdles to get to the vision that you want? So primarily, it's been the cost of sequencing. You know, up until a year ago, it was a thousand dollars true cost. Now it's a hundred dollars true cost. Um, and so that barrier is going to enable fairly pervasive testing. Um, it's it's not a real competitive market because there's there's one sequencer that that is way ahead of everybody else. So the the price is not $100 yet. The cost is below $100. So as soon as there's competition to drive the cost down, um, and hopefully as soon as we all have the protection we need against discrimination, as I mentioned earlier, then we will have large enough sample sizes. And so it is our expectation that um, we will be able to pool data from multiple sources. I, I chair the eHealth Workgroup of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is working on this very issue. And rather than pooling all the data into a single common repository, um, the um, strategy, and, and we're developing our five-year plan in a month in London, um, but the, the goal is to have a federation of uh, essentially um, credentialed data enclaves. Um, that's, that's a formal uh, method. HHS already does that. So you can get credentialed to search all the data that Medicare has on people that's been de-identified according to HIPAA. So we want to provide the same kind of service with appropriate consent at an international scale. And there's a lot of nations that, that um, uh, are talking very much about data um, nationality so that you can't export data. So this approach of a federated model to get at data from all the countries is important. The other thing is the blockchain technology is going to be very profoundly um, useful in this context. So David Hauser of UC Santa Cruz is right now working on a protocol using an open uh, uh, blockchain, public ledger, where you can put out, so for every any typical cancer, you may have a half dozen what are called somatic variants. You know, cancer is a genetic disease. So what has mutated to cause it to behave like a cancer? And if we look at those um, biologically active somatic variants, publish them on a blockchain that's public, so there's not enough data there to re-identify the patient, but we can, if I'm a physician treating a woman with breast cancer, and rather than say, how, what's the protocol for treating a 50-year-old woman with this cell type of cancer? I can say, show me all the people in the world who have had uh, this cancer at the age of 50 with these exact six somatic variants. Find the 200 people worldwide with that. Ask them for consent through a secondary mechanism to donate everything about their medical record. Pool that information to a cohort of 200 that exactly resembles the woman sitting in front of me and find out of the 200 ways they were treated what got the best result. And so that's the kind of future where a, a distributed federated architecture will allow us to query and obtain a very, very relevant cohort so we can basically be treating patients like mine 
sitting right in front of me. Same thing applies for establishing research cohorts. So there, yeah. there's some very exciting stuff at the convergence of big data analytics, machine learning, and uh, blockchain. The, and this is an area that I'm really excited about, and I think we're excited about generally at Intel. We actually have something called the Collaborative Cancer Cloud, which is this kind of federated model. We have three different academic research centers. They have Each of them has a very sizable and valuable collection of genomic data with, with phenotypic um, annotations. So, you know, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, et cetera. And we've actually built a secure computing architecture that can allow uh, a person who's given the right permissions by those organizations to ask a specific question of specific data without ever sharing the data. So. The idea is my data is really important to me. It's valuable. I want us to be able to do a study that gets the number from the 20 pancreatic cancer patients in my cohort up to the 80 that we have in the whole group. But I can't do that if I'm going to just spill my data all over the world. And there are HIPAA and compliance reasons for that. There are business reasons for that. So what we've built at Intel is this platform that allows you to do a... Uh, different kinds of queries on this genetic data and and reach out to these different sources without sharing it. And then the work that I'm really involved in right now and that I'm extremely excited about, this also touches something that both of you said, is it's not sufficient to just get the genomic, the genome sequences. You also have to have the phenotypic data. You have to know what cancer they've had. You have to know that they've been treated with this drug and they survived for three months or that they had this side effect. That, that clinical data also needs to be put together. It's owned by other organizations, right? Other hospitals. So the, the broader generalization of the collaborative cancer cloud is something we call the data exchange. And it's a, it's a misnomer in the sense that we're not actually exchanging data. We're doing analytics on aggregated data sets without sharing it. But it really opens up a world where we can have huge um, populations and big enough amounts of data to actually train these models and, and draw the thread. And of course, that really then hits home for the techniques that Nirvana is bringing to the table and, and of course for the... the Stanford's research. one of your uh, academic medical centers? Not, Not for oh, that okay. collaborative okay. cancer collaborative. The reason I mentioned Stanford is areas. because the reason I'm wearing this Fitbit is because I'm a research subject at Mike Snyder, the chair of genetics at Stanford, IPOP, <clears throat> intrapersonal uh, omics profile. So I was fully sequenced five years ago, and I get four full microbiomes, my gut, my mouth, my nose, my ears, every three months, and I've done that for four, oh, uh, four years now, <laughs> and about a pint of blood. And so uh, to your question about the density of data, so a lot of the problem with applying these techniques to healthcare data is it's basically a sparse matrix, and there's a lot of discontinuities in, in what you can find and operate on. So what Mike is doing with the IPOP study is, is much the same as you described, yeah. creating a highly dense longitudinal set of data that will help us mitigate the sparse matrix problem. Well, I said boxes of stools. Pardon me? What's that? <laughs> right, right, okay. Boxes of stool samples, that's got to be a new one, I've heard that. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was a great question, so I'm going to repeat this and ask if there's another question. You want to go ahead? Oh. Hi, thanks. Uh, so I'm a journalist, and I report a lot on these uh, neural networks, uh, like a system that's better at reading mammograms than you know, human radiologists, mm -hmm. or a system that's better at predicting which patients in the ICU will get sepsis. Yes. Now, these sort of fascinating academic studies that I don't really see being translated very quickly into actual hospitals or clinical mm -hmm. practice. Uh -huh. uh, seems like a lot of the problems are regulatory or yeah. liability or human factors, but how do you get past that and really make this stuff uh, practical? Well, so I, I think there's a few things that we can do there. And I think the proof, proof points in the technology are really important to start with in this specific space, right? In other places, sometimes you can start with other things. But here, like, there's a real confidence problem, right, when it comes to healthcare, for good reason, right? We have doctors trained for many, many years, you know, school and then residencies and, 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 and uh, other kinds of training because we are really, really conservative with healthcare, right? right? So we need to make sure that technology is well beyond just a paper, right? These paper, papers are proof points. They, they get people interested. They even, like, fuel entire grant cycles sometimes, right? And that's what we need to happen. And it's just an inherent problem. It's going to take a while. 
to get those things to a point where it's like, well, I really do trust what this is saying, and I really think it's okay to now start integrating that into our standard of care. I think that's where you're seeing it. It's frustrating for all of us, believe me. I mean, like I said, I think personally, one of the biggest things I want to have an impact, like when I when I go to my grave, is that we use right. machine learning to improve healthcare. Yeah, I really do absolutely. feel that way. But it's just not something we can do very quickly. And as a business person, I don't actually look at those use cases right away because I know the cycle is just going to be long. So to your point, the, the FDA, uh, for about four years now, has understood that the process that has been given to them by their board of directors, otherwise known as Congress, um, <laughs> is, is broken. And so they've been very actively seeking new models of regulation. Yep. And what's really forcing their hand is regulation of devices and software because there, in, in many cases there are black box aspects of that and there's a black box aspect to machine learning historically. Intel and others are making inroads into providing some sort of traceability and transparency into what happens in that black box rather than say, well, overall we get better results but once in a while we kill somebody, right? Um, so there, there is progress being made on that front and there's a concept that, that um, I like to use, uh, everyone knows uh, Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is ne Near. Well, I like to think of the diadarity is near. And the diadarity is where you have human transparency into what goes on in the black box. Um, and so maybe, Bob, you want to speak a little bit about, uh, you mentioned uh, that there's, uh, in a prior discussion, that there's some work going on in Intel in there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we're working with a number of groups to really... Uh, build tools that allow us, in fact, Naveen probably can talk even more detail than I can, but they're tools that allow us to actually interrogate uh, machine learning and deep learning systems to understand not only how they respond to, to a wide variety of situations, but also where are their biases. I mean, uh, one of the yeah. things that's shocking <laughs> is that if you look at the, the clinical studies that are drug safety rules are based on 50-year-old white guys are the, the peak of that distribution, which I don't see any problem with that, but some of you out there might not like that if you're taking a drug. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, we want to understand what are the biases in the data, right? And so um, there's, there's some new technologies. There's actually some very interesting data generative technologies, and this is something I'm also curious what Naveen has to say about that you can generate from small sets of observed data much broader uh, sets of varied data that help probe and fill in your training for some of these systems that are very data dependent. So yeah. that takes us to a place where we're gonna start to see deep learning systems generating data to train other deep learning systems. Mm -hmm. And they start to sort of go back and forth and, and you, start to, you start to have some very nice ways to at least expose the weaknesses of these underlying technologies. And, and that yeah. feeds back to your question about regulatory uh, oversight of this. And there's a fascinating but little known origin of why very few women are in clinical studies. Thalidomide caused birth defects. So rather than say pregnant women can't be enrolled in drug trials, they said any woman who, has, who is at risk of getting pregnant cannot be enrolled. So there was actually a scientific... Uh, meritorious argument back in the day when they really didn't know what was going to happen post thalidomide. So it turns out that the adverse unintended consequence of that decision was we don't have data on women and we know in certain drugs like Xanax that the metabolism is so much slower that the, the, the typical dosing of Xanax in women should be less than half of that for men and a lot of women have had very serious adverse effects by virtue of the fact that they weren't studied. So the point I want to illustrate with that is that regulatory cycles, so people have known for a long time that was like bad way of doing regulation that should be changed. It's only recently getting changed in any meaningful way. So regulatory cycles and legislative cycles are incredibly slow. The rate of exponential growth in technology is exponential. And so there's this impedance mismatch between the cycle time for regulation and the cycle time for innovation. And what we need to do, and this is, I've, I'm working with the FDA, I've done uh, four workshops with them on this very issue, is that they recognize that they need to uh, completely revitalize their process. They're very interested in doing it. They're, they're not resisting it. People think, oh, that bad FDA, they're resisting. Trust me, there's nobody on the planet who wants to revise these review processes more than the FDA itself. And so they're looking at models, and, and what I've recommended is a global crowdsourcing, and the FDA could shift from a regulatory role to one of doing two things, assuring that people who do the reviews are competent, 
and assuring that their conflicts of interest are managed. Because if you don't have a conflict of interest in this very interconnected space, you probably don't know enough to be a reviewer. So there, there has to be a way to manage the conflict of interest. And I think those are some of the key points that the FDA is wrestling with because you know, there's type 1 and type 2 errors. If you under-regulate, you end up with another thalidomide in people born without fingers. If you over-regulate, you prevent life-saving drugs from coming to market. So striking that balance across all these different technologies is extraordinarily difficult. If it were easy, the FDA would have done it four years ago. It's very complicated. Jumping on that question, so I mean, all three of you are in some ways entrepreneurs, right? Within your organization of or started companies. And I think it'll be good to talk a little bit about the business opportunity here, where there's a huge ecosystem in healthcare, different, di different segments, biotech, pharma, insurance payers, et cetera. You know, where do you see is the ripe opportunity or industry ready to really take this on and to make AI the competitive advantage? Well, uh, the last question also included, why, why aren't you using the results of the sepsis detection? We do. There were six or seven published ways of doing it. We did our own data, looked at it, we found a way that was superior to all the published um, uh, methods, and we, we apply that today. So we, we are actually using um, that technology to uh, change clinical outcomes. As, as far as where the opportunities are, um, so it's interesting, because if you look at what's going to be here in three years, we're not going to be using those big data analytics models for sepsis that, we're, that we are deploying today, because we're just going to be getting a tiny aliquot of blood looking for the, the DNA or RNA of any potential infection, and we won't have to infer that there's a bacterial infection from all these other ancillary secondary phenomena. We'll see if the DNA is in the blood. Um, so um, I, it, it, things are changing so fast that the opportunities that people need to look for are what are generalizable and sustainable kind of wins that are going to lead to a revenue cycle that will justify the venture capital um, world investing. So there, there's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the space, but I think uh, some of the biggest opportunities relate to what Bob has talked about um, in, in bringing many different disparate data sources together and really looking for things that are, are not comprehensible in the human brain or in traditional analytic models. And I think there's, uh, we also got to look a little bit beyond direct care, right? That's the one thing that I mean, we're talking about policy and, and how we put, you know, set up standards, these kinds of things. That's one area that's going to drive innovation forward. I completely agree with that. Um, direct care is one piece. How do we scale out uh, many of the knowledge kind of things that are embedded into one person's head and get them out, out to the world and democratize that? Then there's also development of the underlying technologies of medicine, right? Pharmaceuticals. The, the traditional way that pharma pharmaceuticals is developed is actually kind of funny, right? It's a lot of it started just by chance. Right? Penicillin is a very famous story, right? It's not that different today, unfortunately, right? It's conceptually very similar. And now we've got more science behind it. We talk about, you know, domains and interactions, these kinds of things. But fundamentally, the problem is, is what we in computer science called NP-hard. It's too difficult to model. You can't solve it analytically, right? And this is true for all these kind of natural sorts of problems, by the way. And so, um, you know, there's a whole field around this, molecular dynamics and, and, and modeling these sorts of things that actually are being driven forward by these AI techniques. Because it turns out our brain doesn't do magic. It actually doesn't solve these problems. It approximates them very well. And experience allows you to approximate them better and better. Actually, it goes a little bit to what you were saying before, is like simulations and forming neural networks and training off each other. You know, there are these emergent dynamics of like, you can simulate physics, steps of physics, and you come up with a system that's much too complicated to ever solve. Three, three pool balls on a table is one such system. It seems pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You know how to model that, but it actually turns out you can't predict where a ball is going to be once you inject some energy into that table. So something that simple is already too complex. So neural network techniques actually allow us to start making those tractable, right? These NP-hard problems and things like molecular dynamics and actually understanding how different uh, medications and genetics will interact with each other is something we're seeing today. And so I think there's a huge opportunity there. We've actually worked with some customers uh, in this space, and I think um, I'm seeing it like Roche is acquiring a few different companies in this space. Uh, they really want to drive it forward, like using big data to drive drug development. It's kind of counterintuitive. I never would have thought it had I not seen it myself. So. Yeah, lots of... Lots and, of there, and, and, there, and there's a big related challenge because in, in personalized medicine, there's smaller and smaller cohorts of people that will benefit from a drug that still takes $2 billion on average to develop. Right. That is unsustainable. So there, right. there's, a, there's an economic imperative of overcoming the cost and the cycle time for drug development. I, I want to I take the go at this 
question a little bit differently, thinking about not so much where are the, the industry segments that can benefit from AI, but what are the kinds of applications that I think are most impactful. So if this is, if this is what a skilled surgeon needs to know at a particular time to care properly for a patient, this is, this is where most, this area here is where most surgeons are. That is, the, they're close to the maximum knowledge and ability to assimilate as they can be. So it's possible to build complex AI that can pick up on that one little thing and move them up to here, but it's not a gigantic ex accelerator amplifier of, the, of capability. But think about other actors in healthcare, and I mentioned a couple of them earlier. Who do you think the least trained actor in healthcare is? Patients. patients. Yes, the patients. <laughs> patients. The patients are really very poorly trained, including me. I'm I'm abysmal at figuring out who to call and where to go. So well, one of the big opportunities. You, you know as much as the doctor, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my doctor friends always hate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, knowing right. knowing a diagnosis. So, doctor, yeah, doctor Google knows. Um, so, so the opportunities that I see that are really really exciting are when you take an AI agent, what sometimes I like to call a contextually intelligent agent or a CIA, and apply it to a problem where a patient has a complex future ahead of them that they need help navigating, and you use the AI to help them work through post operative. You've got PT, you've got drugs, you've got to be looking for side effects. Uh, an agent can actually help you navigate. It's like your own personal GPS for healthcare. So it's giving you the information that you need about you for your care. That's my definition of precision medicine. And it can include genomics, of course, but it's, it's much bigger. It's that broader picture. And I think those sort of agent way of thinking about things and filling in the gaps where there's less training and more opportunity is uh, is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And Great I had startup a idea right there, by the way. Oh yes, right. Uh, we'll, meet, <laughs> we'll meet you all out back for the next startup. Yeah. I, yeah, I had a conversation with the head of the American Association of Medical Specialties, and just a couple days ago, and what she was saying, and uh, and and I'm aware of this phenomenon, but all of the medical specialists are saying, you're killing us with these stupid board recertification trivia tests that you're giving us. So, so if you're a cardiologist, you have to remember something that happens in one in 10 million people, right? Um, and they're saying, that's irrelevant anymore because we've got advanced decision support coming. We have these kind of analytics coming precisely what you're saying. So it's human augmentation of decision support that is coming at, at blazing speed um, towards healthcare. And so in that context, it's much more important that you have a basic foundation, you know how to think, you know how to learn, and you know where to look. Um, and so all of those things, so we're going to be uh, human augmented um, uh, learning systems much more so than in the past. And so the whole certification process is being revised right now. Yeah. Speak up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sure. The brain is about as complex as it gets. Maybe the microbiome is more complex than the brain. I don't know in terms of the numbers and possibilities of connections. But our brains aren't big enough to understand our brains, clearly. You know, we, need, we need some layer of learning beyond that to kind of completely fathom all the connections and all the possibilities. Right. What makes it fathomable is that you can decompose. Oh, sure. Um, she was saying that our brain is really complex and large, and even our brains don't know how our brains work. So, what are there ways to do we have, to kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a metaphysical, it's a metaphysical question. <laughs> it's turtles all the way down, exactly. That's, that's a great uh, quote. I mean, basically, you can decompose every system. Every complicated system can be decomposed into simpler emergent properties. You lose something, perhaps, with, e with each of those, but you get enough to actually understand most of the behavior. And that's really how we understand the world, right? And that's what we've learned in the last few years what neural network techniques can allow us to do. And that's why our brain can understand our brain. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'd recommend Ray Kurzweil's last book because he addresses that issue in there very elegantly. Yeah. And yeah, we're seeing some really interesting technologies emerging right now where neural network systems are actually 
connecting other neural network systems in networks. Yeah. And that's that's uh, you know you're you can see some very uh, compelling behavior because one of the things I like to distinguish AI versus traditional analytics is we used to have question answering systems. I used to query a database and create a report to find out how many widgets I sold. Then I then I started using um, you know regression or machine learning to to classify complex situations from you know this is one of these and that's one of those. And then as we've moved more recently, we've got these AI like capabilities like being able to recognize that there's a kitty in a photograph. But if you think about it, if I were to show you a photograph that happened to have a cat in it, and I said, what's the answer? You'd look at me like, what are you talking about? I have to know the question. So where we're cresting with these connected sets of neural systems and with AI in general is that the systems are starting to be able to, from the context, understand what the question is. Why would I be asking about this picture? I'm a marketing guy and I'm curious about what logos are in the thing or what kind of cat it is. So it's the being able to ask a question and then take these question answering systems and, and actually apply them. So that's a it's the this this ability to understand context and ask questions that we're starting to see emerge from these more complex hierarchical neural systems. There's a person dying to ask a question. So. Sorry. You have hit on several different topics that all coalesce together. You mentioned personalized models. You mentioned the AI agents that can help you as you're going through a transitionary period. You mentioned data sources, especially across long time periods. Who today has access to enough data to make meaningful progress on that? Not just when you're dealing with an issue, but day-to-day -day improvement of your life and your health. Right. Great question. That is a great question, and I don't think we have a good answer to it. Well, I, I, I'm sure I think, John does. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think every large healthcare organization and various healthcare consortiums are working very hard to achieve that goal. The problem remains in creating uh, semantic interoperability. So I've yeah. spent a lot of my career working on semantic interoperability, and the problem is that if you don't have well-defined or self-defined data, and if you don't have well-defined and documented metadata, and you start operating on it, it's really easy to reach false conclusions, and I can give you a classic example. It's well known with hundreds of studies looking at when you give an antibiotic before surgery and how effective it is in preventing a post-op infection. Simple question, right? So most of the literature uh, done prospectively was done in institutions where they had small sample sizes. So if you pull that, you get a little bit more noise, but you get a more confirming answer. What was done at a very large, not my own, but a very large institution, I won't name them for obvious reasons, but they pooled lots of data from lots of different hospitals where the data definitions and the metadata were different. Two examples. When did they indicate the antibiotic was given? Was it when it was ordered? dispensed from the pharmacy, delivered to the floor, brought to the bedside, put in the IV, or the IV starts flowing. Different hospitals used a different metric of when it started. When did surgery occur? When they were wheeled into the OR? When they were prepped and draped? When the first incision occurred? All different. And they concluded quite dramatically that it didn't matter when you gave the pre-op antibiotic and whether or not you get a post-op infection. And everybody who was intimate with the prior studies just completely dis ignored and discounted that study. It was wrong, and mm -hmm. it was wrong because of the lack of commonality and the normalization of data definitions and metadata definitions. So because of that, this problem is much more challenging than you would think. If it were so easy as to put all this data together and operate on it, normalize and operate on it, we would have done all that a long time ago. It's, it's, Semantic interoperability remains a big problem, and we have a lot of heavy lifting ahead of us in that space. I'm working with the Global Alliance, for example, of Genomics and Health. There's like 30 different major ontologies for how you represent genetic information. And different institutions are using different ones in different ways and different versions over different periods of time. That's a mess. Are all those issues applicable when you're talking about a personalized data set versus a population? Well, so N of 1 studies and single subject research is an emerging field of statistics. So, there, so there's some really interesting new models like, like um, uh, step wedge analytics for doing that on small sample sizes, recruiting people um, uh, asynchronously. There's uh, single subject 
research statistics. You compare yourself with yourself at a different point in time in a different context. So they're merging statistics to do that. And as long as you use the same sensor, you won't have a problem. But people are changing their remote sensors and you're getting different data measured in different ways with different sensors and different normalization and different calibration. So yes, it even yeah. persists in the N of one environment. Yeah, you have to get start with a, a large N that you can apply to the N of one. I'm gonna actually attack your question from a different perspective. So, so who has the data, the millions of examples to train a, a, a deep learning system from scratch? It's a very limited set right now. Um, technologies such as the Collaborative Cancer Cloud and Data Exchange are definitely impacting that and creating larger and larger sets of critical mass. Uh, and you know, notwithstanding the very challenging semantic interoperability questions, but there's another, there's another opportunity, Kay asked about what's changed recently. One of the things that's changed in deep learning is that we now have modules that have been trained on massive data sets that are actually very smart at certain kinds of problems. So for instance, you can go online and find deep learning systems that actually can recognize better than humans whether there's a cat, dog, motorcycle, house in a photograph. From now Intel, that, open source. Yes, from <laughs> Intel, open source. So here's, here's what happens next. Because that the first, most of that deep learning system is very expressive, that combinatorial mixture of features that Naveen was talking about when you have all these layers, there's a lot of features there that are actually very general to images, not just finding cats, dogs, trees. So what happens is you can do something called transfer learning where you take a small or modest data set and actually re-optimize it for your specific problem very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to see a place where you can, on one end of the spectrum, where we're getting access to the computing capabilities and the data to build these incredibly expressive deep learning systems and over here on the right, we're able to start using those deep learning systems to solve custom versions of problems. And I just, last weekend or two weekends ago, in 20 minutes I was able to take one of those general systems and create one that could recognize all different kinds of flowers. Very subtle distinctions that I would never be able to know that on my own, but I happened to be able to get the data set and literally it took 20 minutes and I had this vision system that I could now use for a specific problem. I think that's incredibly profound, and I think we're going to see this spectrum of wherever you are in your in your you know ability to get data and to define problems and to put hardware in place to to see really neat customizations and a proliferation of applications of this kind of technology. So one other trend I think I'm very hopeful about is so this is a hard problem clearly, right? I mean, getting data together, formatting it, it's just, it, from many different sources, it's, it's one of these things that's probably never going to happen perfectly, right? But one trend I think that is extremely hopeful to me is the fact that the cost of gathering data has precipitously dropped. Building that thing is, is almost free these days, right? And I can write software and put it on, on 100 million cell phones in an instance. You couldn't do that five years cool. ago even, right? And so the, the, the amount of information we can gain from a cell phone today has gone up. Right? We have more sensors. We're bringing online more sensors. People have Apple Watches and they're sending it, you know, even um, uh, uh, blood data back to the phone. So once we can actually start gathering more data and do it cheaper and cheaper, it actually doesn't matter where the data is. I can write my own app, I can gather that data, and I can start driving, you know, the, the, the correct uh, inferences or useful inferences back to you. So that is a positive trend, I think, here. And it's, personally, I think that's how we're going to solve it, is by uh, gathering it from many different sources cheaply. Hi, my name is Pete. Um, I very much enjoyed the conversation so far, but I, I was hoping perhaps to bring a little more focus into uh, precision medicine and ask two questions. Uh, number one, uh, how have you applied uh, you know, the AI technologies as they're emerging so rapidly uh, to your natural language processing? I'm particularly, particularly interested in uh, you know, if you look at things like Amazon Echo or Siri or the other voice recognition systems that are based on AI, they've, they're, they've just become incredibly accurate. And I'm interested in specifics about how I might use technology like that in medicine. 
So where would I find a, a medical nomenclature and perhaps uh, some reference to a back end that works that way? And the second thing is, what specifically is Intel doing or making available? And you mentioned some open source stuff on cats and dogs and stuff. But I'm, I'm the doc, so I'm looking at the medical side of that. Um, what are you guys providing that would allow us, uh, you know, who are kind of geeks on the software side as well as being docs, to experiment a little bit more thoroughly uh, with AI technologies? You know, Google has a free AI toolkit. Uh, I'm, you know, several other people have put, come out with free AI toolkits in order to accelerate that. There's special hardware now with graphics coprocessors hitting amazing uh, speeds. And so I was wondering, you know, where do I go, you know, in Intel to find some of those tools and perhaps learn a bit about the fantastic work uh, that, that you guys are already doing at Kaiser? So let me, let me take the, that first part and then we'll be able to talk about the MD part. So in terms of the technology, this is what is extremely exciting now about what Intel is focusing on. We are providing those, those pieces so you can actually assemble them and build the applications. How you build that application specific for MDs and, 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 and the, the use cases is, is up to you or, or the one who's building an application. But we're going to power that technology from multiple perspectives. So uh, Intel already is, is the main force behind the data center, right? Cloud computing, all of this is already Intel. We're making that extremely amenable to AI and making it, um, uh, setting the standard uh, for AI in, in, the, in the future. So. We can do that from a number of different mechanisms. For somebody who wants to develop an application quickly, we have hosted solutions. Um, Intel Nirvana is, is kind of the brand for these kinds of things. Hosted solutions to get you going very quickly. Uh, once you get to a certain level of scale where, where costs start making more sense, things can be brought on premise. We're supplying that. We're also supplying uh, software that makes that transition essentially free. Right? Then taking those solutions that you develop on the cloud or develop uh, uh, in the data center and actually deploying them on a device, like you want to write something on your uh, smartphone or, or PC or whatever, we're actually providing that those hooks as well. So we want to make it very easy for developers to take these pieces and actually build solutions out of them quickly. So you probably don't even care what hardware it's running on. You're like, here's my data set, this is what I want to do, train it, make it work, go fast, right? make my developers um, uh, efficient. That's all you care about, right? And that's, that's what we're doing. We're taking it from that point and how do we best do that? We're going to provide those technologies. The next couple of years, there's going to be a lot of new stuff coming from Intel. And do you want to talk about AI uh, Academy as well? Yeah, that's a, a great, uh, a great segue there. So, uh, in addition to this, we have an entire set of um, uh, tutorials and and other online resources and things we're going to be bringing into the academic world um, for people to to get going quickly. So that's not just enabled enablement on our tools, but also just general concepts. What is a neural network? How does it work? How does it train? Like all of these things are available now, and we have them in a nice digestible class form format that you can actually go and uh, play with. Let me give a couple of quick answers uh, in addition to the great answers already. Um, so you're asking why can't we use medical terminology and do what Alexa does? Um, um, well, well, no, no, no. I, I, you may not be aware of this, but Andrew Ng, who was the AI guy at Google, was recruited to Baidu. They have a medical chatbot in China today. Um, I haven't been able, I don't speak Chinese, I haven't been able to use it yet. Um, there are two similar initiatives in this country that I know of. There's probably a dozen more in stealth mode, but Lumiata and HealthCap are doing chatbots uh, for healthcare today using medical terminology. You have the compound problem of semantic normalization within language compounded by a cross language. Um, I've done a lot of work with an international organization called SNOMED, which translates um, medical terminology, and so, so you're aware of that. We could talk offline um, if you want, because I'm pretty deep into the uh, semantic space. Go Google Intel Nirvana, and you'll see all the websites there. So Intel.com slash AI or nirvanasys.com. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, this has been fantastic. I want to, first of all, thank all the people here for coming to, and asking great questions. I also want to thank our fantastic panelists today. Thanks, um, everyone. And then lastly, and lastly, I just want to share one bit of information. We will have more discussions on AI um, next Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Diane Bryant, who's our general manager of data centers group, will be here to do a keynote. So I hope you all get to join that. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.